covenant love, would you welcome with me Abner Suarez as he comes to minister the Word of God for us today. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you give God praise for a moment? Father, we give you glory. We thank you for what you've already... Just lift your hands. We thank you for what you've already done. But we say there's more to come in the next few moments. Father, I declare that this is a cathedral of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you are welcome to do whatever you want. I bless your people to hear, to receive, and to... uh, adjust to everything you're doing in this room. I need your help, Father. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Put your words in my mouth. Thank thank you for the angel of the Lord that's here, Lord. Thank you that this is Bethel, the gate of heaven, the house of God, the place where the angels of God ascend and descend. Would you unveil your beautiful son once again this morning to us? Let your kingdom come and let your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. In Fayetteville, as it is in heaven today. That which you've destined to come to earth today, let it be so. In Jesus' name. You can be seated. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you, Pastor Al. Do you know in your life you need people who believe in you? God believes in you, but then one of the ways he expresses your understanding of that is he has people who believe in you. Amen. Hey, why don't you stand? I know we stood, we clapped and all that, but let's turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Yeah. The Word of God is definitely worth standing up for. There are people, there are men and women in heaven who died to get that Word in your hands. So Hebrews chapter 6. But without faith... It's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You may be seated. I want to talk to you this morning, and there's a subject that I haven't been been able to get away from from, for the last year, and it's the subject of faith. Obviously, we won't exhaust it in one service or one sitting, but I believe an understanding of how we're supposed to relate to God in in this concept of faith, because faith is the only way you can relate to God, and you're not going to ever do anything in the kingdom of God without faith. But to understand faith, I believe you'll have to start in in the book of beginnings, the the, the Genesis chapter 1. We know God created the heavens and the earth, and then he speaks the universe into existence, and then he puts man into a garden. And he puts man into a garden, and he makes him the steward and his representative on the earth. And man had the, had the privilege of doing two things. He got to walk in eternal fellowship with God. And he also got the privilege of extending the dominion of God upon the earth. And as long as he, uh, as long as he o- obeyed God, it's a very interesting thing about God. I, 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 I often say this, that God, I believe, has a sense of humor. Because he, he did not give any instructions to Adam on spiritual warfare. You know, you would think with the devil there, he would go, hey, by the way, there's going to be a devil there. Be careful of him. Make sure you... All he does is says, don't eat from this tree and obey me. Obey God, destroy the devil. You won't ever have to worry about the devil when you're obeying God. And so... He puts him in this perfect garden and he puts him in this perfect place and he was built for eternal fellowship with God. He was built to walk with God and he was also built to discover things in the in in the earth that God created, extend the creation of God upon the earth and and enjoy the beauty of God. Now, it's important to stop here for a minute and remember that the earth was absolutely perfect. Amen. There's no flaw in the earth when God creates it. And when Adam is put upon the earth, he has no worries and he has no fears. And an important thing is, he actually, as as he walked with God, he got to create the future with God and he had no worries about the future. Amen? 
It wasn't like Adam's going, oh, what am I going to do today? What am I going to do tomorrow? What's going to happen? Everything he needed was in that garden as long as he stayed under the dominion of God. Now we know there was a mistake that happened. A mistake that God never intended, but he did plan for. Keep that in mind when you're walking with God. He may not have intended you to make certain mistakes, but he's so good and he's so wonderful, he can redeem it all. That's a good God. He's definitely, he's definitely not like me sometimes. Like, just forget them, God. Just whatever. They messed up, you know. Anytime I want to not have grace for somebody, I remember how gracious God's been to me. And then you get humble again. <laughs> You know, self-righteousness is one of the worst things you can ever have. And so uh, they, they make a mistake. They agree with the enemy and darkness and destruction now had a legal right to come into the world. The, earth, the, the DNA of man was corrupted and so was the earth. Now, that was a bad day in human history. In fact, Jewish history says that, you know, Adam didn't die. He stuck around for a while, and Enoch, that says that Jewish history teaches that Enoch wanted to ask, ask them one day, what was it like to walk with God before the, before the fall? I wouldn't have wanted to have that conversation, and neither did Adam. He was on Dr. Phil's couch very often. That's tough. The DNA of man was corrupted. The DNA of the earth was corrupted. But the, but the good news is this. Even before the earth was created... The, uh, the, the, the Bible says this, Revelation 13, Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. God had a plan even, when, e- even, before, even before the earth was created that he knew he would, get, he would make provision so that man could walk, man and woman could walk with him exactly as he intended. And when destruction entered the world, I forgot to say this, when destruction entered the world, back it up for a minute, when destruction entered the world, a system came into the world that God never intended. It's known as the Babylonian system. It's basically the world system. Don't think 666. Don't think John Hagee in charge. Just think of this. The system that came into the world is this. It, 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 a system came in the world that God never intended. It was this. It was now man trying to make its way in the world without God. And without God, he now had fear of the future and dictating what would happen to him. One of the number one fears I've discovered among people in the earth is this. They are worried about what's going to happen. They are worried about what, something that will even come that they're not ready for. And there's this constant fear of what's going to happen. It is very difficult to live in this world without God. And this Babylonian system was built to put pressure, was built to put fear, was built to put performance on you. Because at the center of that system, whether you realize it or not, is the serving of something because you were created to serve something or yourself at the middle, even if you're quote unquote successful. I told the conference uh, this week, I was watching this show. This young man, very, very wealthy, and he was doing really well, $4 million apartment, great real estate. He was selling all these things, but in the show, he's looking at his fiance. He's about to get married, and he goes, I, you don't realize this. I have all this pressure on me. I have 45 employees who, who look to me, and, and I have to do this because if not, they don't get paid, and even if you're successful without God, you are the center of your world, but the good news was this. It's, it's going to get better and better this morning. Jesus made a way so you did not have to participate in the system of this world. And Jesus went before us. And on the cross, he died for every person in the room to come back to him to live in the system of heaven known as the kingdom of God. And every person in this room, it's called, he gave you the ability to respond to the work he did on the cross, and that's called being born again. And it illustrates us something, though, even about the cross of Jesus. Anything that God asks of any person in this room, he's given you the power to do, even becoming born again. So here's the first principle. Of, I got to, it took me a while to get there. But, but it says, here's an important principle of faith. Faith is a gift that must be received. You cannot even get born again without God's help on your behalf. 
scholars and commentators, they're, 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 they're unsure of, of the origins, whether you have a measure of faith when you're born or you respond to a measure of faith when the gospel is given. But even the ability to get born again is a gift given to you by God, but you have a choice of whether you're going to respond. Here's how the Apostle Paul put it. In two different places, Romans 12, verse 3. For I say to you, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than you ought, but to think soberly as God has, this is Romans 12, verse 3, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. There's two instances, there might be more, I just see two, where Paul emphasizes that this gift of faith is not something of your own. It's something that he gives you. Uh, Romans 11, he said, in him, through him, and, and, and to him above all things. That means everything that we give to God, he is first given to us. Ephesians 2, now, he emphasizes this again. Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 10. For by grace, do you know what grace is? Grace is God's overwhelming desire to treat you like Jesus. Undeserved, uh, under, undeserved merit is not necessarily, a, a, it, it's, 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 it's sort of a truth, but Jesus had grace, so he didn't get undeserved favor because he was perfect. It got quiet for a minute, but it's true. <laughs> for by grace you've been saved, what does he say? Not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk therein. So however we heard the gospel message, I am fascinated how people get born again. I, I met somebody this year that they know, their parents never brought them to church. They lived in America. They didn't know Jesus. But 9-11 happened. They go, there must be a God, and I must find out who he is. That's how they got born again. I have another friend. He's one of the most brilliant people in the world. PhD from one of these, I don't ever remember, I think Caltech, Cal Polytech or something. And he was a very, very smart, um, very, very smart man, still is. And he talks about things. I don't understand what he says half the time, but I just kind of just shake my head. And he was in, I think, a freshman in college. And these young men were explaining to him salvation. See, when you hear the gospel message, because you were born to serve him, it does something on the inside of you. You don't stop opening your mouth. Don't believe the law. Oh, nobody wants. Listen, people are hungry for the real thing. They really are hungry. And so he, he, they explained the gospel message. And his thought was, his whole life was, anyone who believes that, they got to be stupid. No, that's what he thought. And so he comes back to his dorm room. He goes, God, he, in his, you know, because it starts working in you. This has got to be true. He goes, God, I'll serve you, but I don't want to be stupid. And he said, I heard the voice of God. He said, no deal. God doesn't negotiate with you. Next night, he's in his dorm room. He goes, okay, God, I'll give you everything. And God said, deal. But it's only God himself who gives you the ability to respond to him. So faith, characteristic one, that's very important to know, and it's important to know this because you'll see that the characteristic of faith that you come into the kingdom of God with, that you don't earn it, is a characteristic that we have to live by. So faith is a gift that must be received. Faith is a gift that must be received. Here's some characteristics of faith also. Faith is a place of divine exchange and conversion. You have the ability, whether you know it or not, many people, I say this often because I'm discovering this, many people switch identities. I'm spitting now. Now I'm really preaching good. <laughs> many people switch identities, but they haven't learned to switch systems. So faith is a place of divine exchange and conversion. It's getting better. Faith brings you into the freedom of no longer being governed by the five senses, but from the mind of Christ. You will live a limited Christian walk if all you are governed by what you see, feel, and think. You are never, you are meant, never meant to be limited by that. Look at, you look, Adam is one of our models. He looks at those animals and he sees with the mind of Christ and he's able to name them. His soul didn't help name them. God helped him name them. Faith sets into motion our future as God intends. Faith anchors us in the superior world of the kingdom of God. Faith anchors believers to live from the kingdom, not trying to obtain the kingdom. Now, 
faith is not just, uh, it's not just like, oh, it's good to live by faith. faith. This is really important. Faith is the only way you can relate to God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, for we live, New King James says we walk. We live by faith and not by sight. Faith is equated with righteousness and is what pleases God in the kingdom of God. Faith is not birthed in the inward man. Faith is not of the soul or the mind. The renewed mind operating in faith has the ability to affect mind, will, and emotions. God is not against an intellectual mind. He's not against seeing with your natural eyes. I hope when you leave here, you look both ways before you cross the street. I say that because in, in my upbringing, my church upbringing, it was almost like you, you, were, you, were, you were like anointed if you didn't think. God is far too brilliant to be an intellectual. He just wants your intellect renewed to the truth of his mind. The renewed, I've said this, the renewed mind operating of faith has the ability to affect the mind, will, and emotions. So we come into the kingdom of God by faith, and it defines how we're supposed to relate to God. Many people come into the kingdom of God by faith, and then fail to ever learn to live by faith. The Lord spoke to to me about a year and a half ago. Millions have believed God for saving faith, but have been robbed of living a life of faith because of ignorance. Listen, there's no blessing in ignorance. Don't believe that southern cultural thing. Ignorance will kill you and let the enemy destroy you. Unbelief, fear, and a religious structure that does not develop people in their identity. So the origins, we come into the kingdom by faith and we're called to live by faith. Now it's going to get better. It's getting better. Faith to overcome the world has been given to every believer. This is, this is, this, this is where the web meets the road. You have been given, if you're in Christ today, to overcome everything that's in front of you. You might not feel like it. You might not sense it. It might not look like it. But there is a resident gift inside of you given by God to overcome sickness, disease, poverty, unforgiveness, anything that you have. You can do it. Listen, sometimes I go to, I go to sleep by faith. Because my mind is constantly, last night, and I got to go to bed. 1 John 5. For this, 1 John 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. I just read that because it's just too good. For whatever is born of God. How many are in Christ? Lift your hands. This is a prophetic word for you. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. It doesn't mean, it doesn't say you win some and you lose some. It doesn't mean you can have, it doesn't say you can have some good days and bad days. It says you overcome everything in this world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith, our faith, your faith has been given to you to overcome the world. Why is this important? Because working with believers now, 12 and 13 years, here's what I have discovered. It's not said, but it is in a mindset. There is a belief that somehow when we relate to God, it's like going to a Holy Spirit casino. You put your, you put your chips in and hope God will help you and hope God will do something. I know he likes Pastor I know he likes Abner. He's got a nice white shirt on today. God's really using him. And I know he's, you know, he's going to come minister to us and help us get through the day. No, the same faith that's been given to me, the same faith that's been given to every five full believer has been given to you to relate to God. He doesn't just put up with you. He hears everything you say when you stand in faith. It's been given to you to overcome the world. Now it's going to get better. Everything you need to fulfill your destiny, purpose, calling, you can receive by walking in a lifestyle of faith. And if you can't receive it by faith, you don't need it. And because you're in the kingdom of God, you don't have to operate like the world. You don't have to manipulate anyone. You don't have to talk to the right people. You have the favor and the faith of God. And here's the other thing. Faith 
takes you out of being a victim of the world around you. Listen, there is a whole propaganda movement now even spurring in the United States that makes victims out of everybody. Listen, here's the truth. Here's the absolute truth. Should we, should we combat injustice? Yes, should we say things about racism? But let me tell you something. Just because you're black, just because you're white. Listen, I've experienced racism. But don't let anyone say, oh, you can't make it ahead. You can't get ahead. In any culture, because you stand in the kingdom of God, you have the favor of God to overcome everything. Listen. If your boss, if your company has institutional racism, because you have favor of God, he'll either take that boss out or he'll move you somewhere else because you have favor of God. Psalm 512, he surrounds the righteous with favor. Here's important to understand, though. This is very important. Listen, you, how many know you didn't earn your salvation? You can't earn anything in the kingdom. You don't need to earn your promotion. You don't need to earn paying for your light bill. You can receive it by faith. Sometimes we think faith is like this works thing. Now we have to utilize the gift of faith, but we're definitely not earning it. I get very nervous around people. Well, my faith got me this. My faith got me that. No, the faith that God gave you, that you used, allowed you to do it. Another important characteristic of faith. Something just happened there. You can, uh, this is very important to understand if you want to live a lifestyle of faith. Faith is God's gift to you to understand the world. You cannot understand the world unless you've stepped into faith. Oh, that's what it was. It was down there. Why do I say that? Because in our Western culture, we often want to understand and have faith. You don't have understanding and then faith. You have faith that causes you to understand. Let's go back to the origins. Let's go back to the origins. This is what we believe. If you, how many are in Christ? If you're in Christ, this is what you believe. There was an eternal Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who spoke the universe into existence. He created a perfect world. He puts Adam in that world. He, 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 he doesn't agree with God. He messes up. But we know Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He finds one man. I'm telling you, God is funny. He finds one man. He goes, I'm going to make covenant with you, and I'm going to raise up a nation that will serve me, kings and priests, and, and they'll be raised up. We know he raises up this nation of Israel. First, they go into a captivity and then after they come out of captivity everything that God promised Israel in 300 years he fulfills I'm going to stop here for a minute because they're the worst they're, they're, they're the most economic economically depressed they're in poverty they're illiterate and in that moment God is going I'm going to give you houses that you did not build lands that see he's what you, can you imagine that they're looking at their children going, I can't even feed my child. And he, go, he starts talking to you about what he thinks way different. He thinks way beyond where you're at. They don't fully fulfill the purpose of God for their life. 400 years of silence, people are like, it's never been that bad. No, I'm glad I didn't live during that time. But then something happened. And, and all during this time, these prophets, they're declaring there's a Messiah coming. What are they doing? They are speaking into existence the future world for a Messiah. An angel of the Lord, Gabriel gets all the good assignments, comes to a young teenage girl. She go, and he's talking to her. He goes, the Messiah is inside of you. She goes, how can this be? I've never, I've never been with the man. She goes, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And she says, let it be according to your word. And a king of the world is born in a manger. He's raised up. I always like to say, what were the lost years of Jesus like? We don't know what his child, he was a perfect child. Jesus, go to bed. Yes. Jesus, eat your broccoli. Yes. He doesn't start his public ministry the moment, he become, he, the, the moment he, he's an adult. He's a carpenter. His stuff wasn't cheap, I guarantee it. He's in marketplace ministry. It's not till the age of 30. That he begins his public ministry. And then he picks 12 guys who all still needed deliverance. 
He spoke like no other man spoke and he did miracles like no other man died. And then he died. He didn't just Hollywood die. That needs to be emphasized. He died, died, died so you could live forever. And then he rose again. And I'm telling you, he's got a sense of humor because now he stands in front of all those guys who have failed the final exam of the Jesus Christ School of Ministry. Everyone except John, they've all dispersed him. He goes, by the way, guys, all authority has been given to me. Now go and make disciples of nations. He goes, by the way, don't leave this place since you receive the Holy Spirit because that Holy Spirit that I had, it's yours. That's what you believe. If you are in Christ, that's what you need to believe. Either you believe the whole thing or don't believe any of it. If you believe that, it takes faith to believe that. You don't understand that and have faith. You have to have faith that causes you to understand. Here it is biblically. Rome, uh, 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 Hebrews 11 verse 3. By faith, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things, the things which are seen were not made of things that are visible. Faith lets you step into the unseen realm and see as God sees. Everybody in here, you must know that you are commanded to see the world like Jesus. Jesus looked at, we, we, we touched on it a moment ago. Jesus looked at those disciples and he looked at them. Everybody in the world goes, they're ignorant. Peter's got a cussing problem. He's got a bunch of unforgiveness. Unfor- and Jesus just goes, follow me. You have to have eyes of faith to see that. Samuel comes in to anoint the next king of Israel. And everybody thinks it's Aaliyah because he went to Harvard. And he was gifted and his SATs were high. And God goes, that is not the one. Faith gives you eyes to see the world. You cannot understand the world unless you're seeing through the eyes of faith. Here's another characteristic. I'm telling you, it's going to get better. Faith is choosing to have a high view of God. What does that mean? You, 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 I, you, you, you should think a lot of God. <laughs> I think he's amazing. It is not sufficient to believe he's amazing, but not amazing to do things through you. When you see your situation, do you see God in that situation? Oh, I know it's not looking good. I know my child might be working on their testimony. But what is a high view of God? As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. I'm struggling a little financially, but this is what God has said. You said you would open up the windows of heaven and open up room enough that there's not, that not enough to receive. What's not enough to receive? How many, how many can open up your house and have not enough room to receive? Faith is choosing to have a high view of God. Faith is God's gift to access what has been made available to you in the kingdom. Faith is God's gift to access what has been made available to you in the kingdom. Romans 8. How many realize that God is not keeping anything from anyone in this room? Everything that he has made available for your purpose, your life, your destiny, he has already gone before you. He's already gone before you and made a way. I often see that as I'm walking with God, as I'm facing any situation, I often go into these, these pictures and vision. And I'll see just Jesus walking. He's already gone before you. You've already taken care of it. Faith is God's gift to access what has been made available to you in the kingdom of God. Here's a faith objective, and we'll talk a minute here about how our faith grows. In education, they had these concepts, and if you in college, I don't know if they do it in high school now. It's been a little while since I've been there. Not that long ago, but. And I call this an objective of faith, and we find it in Matthew, the 8th chapter. We won't read the whole story just for the sake of time. There's a centurion man. Now, keep this in mind about about posturing God, with, uh, about approaching God with a posture of faith. There are times in my life, and I know many of you have probably experienced this because we're in a room of people who love God, where God will do things for me that I didn't ask for, didn't plan for, and it's absolutely amazing. That's a truth in God. But the majority of the time that I relate to God, I must believe Him by faith to receive everything I need. 
And what you'll see, and I encourage you, your, your uh, homework this week, because you're good Bible students, amen? amen? Read the Gospels. Watch this. Jesus never turned anyone away who came to him in faith. He never said, well, you know, it's not conference time. You can't receive this. And when he would dialogue with them, he would always try to bring them to a place of faith so they knew. See, Jesus doesn't want you on welfare. He wants you to fare well. Read, one of my favorite stories is, is uh, Mark 10. Because he, he, he's trying to get Nicodemus to a place. He knows, I, I believe in my heart, he knows he's going to heal him. But what he's trying to teach him is just how you had faith to believe me for your healing. You're no longer a beggar anymore. The faith that you use to receive healing, now you're not the beggar anymore. All your provision can come to me. So now we have this centurion man. He comes to Jesus, and it's important to know that he's a centurion man because Jesus was a Jew who what came to the Jew first, not the Gentile. But again, he never turns anyone away who comes in faith. And he comes to him, and he goes, my, my servant is sick. And Jesus goes, I will come and heal him. Every time I read that and every time I say it, I go, I'd make Jesus come to my house. I'd get a selfie with him. We'd be on Instagram. Like, Jesus, hang out for a while. And this is extraordinary. This centurion man, this pagan man. Listen, whether they realize it or not, a lot of unbelievers have faith in things that most believers don't have faith for. And he goes to him, no, I'm a man under authority and I know the power of a word. Because he knew as a centurion, when he spoke, it was done. And he goes, you're Jesus, so if you speak, just, just speak it, it's done. And th that, that, that's beautiful because Jesus goes, big faith. Here's, here's the beautiful part of the story. It says, when Jesus heard that, he marveled. So here's my prayer. Lord, let me marvel at my trust in you. You can actually allow the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to marvel at your trust in Him. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit don't want you just rooted in situational faith. They want you rooted in identificational faith. What do I mean by that? One of, my, one of my pains is this. Sometimes, I'll, I, I've seen this several times. You've been in a meeting. God is moving powerfully. Healings, deliverance, and people getting ministered to. And, and people just being used by the Lord. Different people. And you, you, maybe you go have a meal because that's what you do when you're Pentecostal. You eat. It's true. It's like food's everywhere in the body of Christ. Usually it's bad food too. I'm working on that. And... You know, I'll, you'll have a discussion, maybe a leader, and I'll go, hey, you need to do this. You need to do, I, I really feel like God's calling. Oh, I know I'm supposed to do that. But I, I, there's, I just don't have the money for that. And I'm thinking to myself, you just saw through your own hands, blind eyes open. Somebody come out of a wheelchair. You have a tremendous prophetic gifting. And you think money's a problem for God? What is that? Situational faith. God's goal is identificational faith. You said it, it's possible. So here's how he, teaches, how he teaches us to grow up in this concept of faith. No one's arrived, no one's perfected. Amen? We're all at different places and things that maybe God would call me to believe for, he hasn't called you to believe for, but we're all called to walk by faith. And everyone has been given the measure of faith and there's a master discipleship program of God for your life. And his master discipleship program is that you grow into big, strong faith because the, the, most, foolish, the most foolish and arrogant thing you can ever do, I, I, you know, I just want to make it, just want to make it through my family. You are foolish and you are arrogant because your faith was meant to be used to help others break through. There's a, a man in South Carolina. I helped him, hopefully. Walking out of the church, he goes, I, just, I just, just need enough to get by. I said, sir, I'm sorry, but you are a very selfish man because you were meant to change the world around you. 
So everyone's been given that measure of faith. And don't think that God is not judging where you're at. Because he says big faith, small faith, little faith. Jesus would actually describe people's faith. He had no problem telling people where they're at. But the problem, the, 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 the response of every person in this room is that we get in line with that mastership discipleship program of walking by faith and growing in faith. He expects that measure of faith to grow. It's not what you have when you come in. It's what you do with what you have. And so you come into the kingdom, and he expects that measure of faith to grow. So Pastor Al was just asking me, how does your faith grow? I'm glad you asked. How does your faith grow? <laughs> <laughs> Principle number one, and I don't know how much time left, but we're, we're going to stick here for a minute. How does your faith grow? Number one is this. Your faith is meant to grow in the context of fellowship, relationship, and encounter with God. No one can have a relationship with God for you. You will never go beyond your place of fellowship and relationship with God. That's why many believers, they've been born again for 20 years. They might speak in tongues, but they still have small faith because they may be saved for 20 years, but they're still in first grade in faith. It's not how long you've been saved. It's what you've done in the time you've been saved. And why is this so important? Jesus likened our walk with him to this house. And in this house, certain things will happen as a result of walking with him. And here's, here's one of the number one things is this. You will, in the context of fellowship and relationship with God, you will hear the voice of God. And here's what, here's what Jesus said. Man shall not live by bread alone, what? but by every word that proceeds at the mouth of God. So in the context of fellowship with God, you will hear the voice of God. A lot of people, how do you feel the voice of God? Have a relationship with God. Well, I don't hear it. I've been saying, so one of the things you need to change is what's coming out of your mouth probably. And then he says this, what? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. It doesn't come from having heard what somebody else heard. Faith comes by hearing. And I've learned this. Faith comes by hearing over and 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 over again. And here's what, I, what, what I've learned. I'll tell you a story here in a minute. I'll tell you right now. I was in South Africa in November about two years ago. I was running one day because you don't look like this overnight. It takes hard work. And I'm thinking, western traffic, I'll see, I'll see the cars coming. And um, they were driving the wrong way. So I step across the street, don't see this huge dump truck that's like bigger than my, I mean huge. You have to get a, a ladder to get inside. The driver's on the other side. I see it at the last second, and it's like slow motion, and I'm going, I'm going to die today. And I wasn't going to die because Jesus was calling an angel home. I was going to die because I wasn't smart enough to realize my surroundings. And I did something very spiritual. I lifted up my hands and I screamed like a girl at the last minute. I didn't pray in tongues. I didn't say, Jesus, I wish I did. But this is what came up. Ah! <laughs> and all I did was there was a graze on my elbow. And I thought, I was, I was like, am I dead? No, I'm still in Cape Town, South Africa. It's pretty awesome there, but it's not heaven. <laughs> so that will make you think about eternity. I go back to my hotel room, and I'm sitting on the edge of my bed, and I'm thinking, I should have died today. He's, the driver, like, pulls over to the side of the road. He's, like, looking at me. He's, like, are you okay? I said, I think so. And he's, like, how are you alive? I, I just kind of, he just kept staring at me. I don't know what happened. I, I just, I do know this. When it's not your time to die, the enemy can't destroy you, even when you're stupid. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> So the Holy Spirit starts speaking to me. And he says to me, you know, if you would have died today, you would have been with me. I said, yes, I know that. And he says to me, why do you know that you'd be with me? And, he, uh, and uh, I said, well, I remember I was no more than four years old in Sunday school class. My pastor's wife explaining to us little children that day. She had a little, one of those boards. I don't know if they still have them. And, you know, they got the figures. And she says, Jesus died. And he's the king of the world. 
and we've all messed up. We've all made mistakes. But if you ask him into your heart, you can make him savior of your life. And if you ever die, and if anything ever happens, you'll be with him. And as a little kid, that sounded really good to me. And so I received Jesus that day. But here's a truth that I kept hearing over and over and over again. We, we, were, we were Pentecostal. We shouted at everything. We shouted at heresy. Even it was bad. Like, we just shouted every time we came to church. But one truth we heard over and over again. To, to, to be absent from your body is to be present with the Lord if you're in Christ. I didn't just hear it one Sunday. I heard it every single Sunday. So it was a truth that went deep, deep, deep inside of me. It was a reality that I didn't ever question anymore because it had gone deep into the heart of me. And so here's what the Lord said to me. He said, just like you know, you'll be, I have no doubts. I think I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm shooting for 120, but if, if something unplanned happens, I'll be with him. I'm already dead anyway. He said, just like you believe, you'll be with me one day. I want you to believe everything I tell you that way. But here's what I learned for me to really, but not just hear it. Knowledge is not sufficient. It's a reception of faith that allows you to define your thinking from that moment forward. A lot of people know things, but they've never actually received it in their heart and their mind and made it part of their high view of God. And so I've learned this. We live in the greatest time to be alive. There's so much understanding out there. I mean, you can get, you know, probably not going to help my sales today, but you can get so much free information out there anywhere. YouTube, you can still listen to sermons by all Roberts, Kenneth Cole. I mean, you, it's all out there. Five steps to a better you, five steps to this, you know, great five steps to here. It's all out there. And here's what I find with even many enthusiastic believers. We live very schizophrenic development in our walk with God. And what do I mean by that? One week, you know, we're at a send conference, so we're 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 gonna we're gonna lock into identity. Next week, we go to a prophetic seminar. And now we're all prophets. Next week, we're here. And now we're apostles. And here's what happens: we never allow the truth of the subject God wants to get deep inside of us to saturate our hearts and our mind. I'm st- I I've learned this. I'm still listening to things I heard six and excuse me, seven years ago. Why? Because it hasn't transformed my thinking to the extent that I know God wants it to. Here's what's even more important. The measure by which you honor the word of God will determine the fruitfulness you have in life. Two quick things. I don't have time to read it, but here it is. Story of David and Goliath. That's your other homework this week. There's a part of that story that is fascinating to me, and it's this. David shows up because he obeys his father. He's bringing bread and cheese sandwiches. I'm telling you, God is funny. I'm sure in his journal, he didn't write that day, I'm going to defeat Goliath. But when he shows up on the battle, there, there, he sees Goliath... And there's two things that you'll notice when you read the story. The guys, the men who are trained for battle are all in fear. Faith comes by hearing, so does fear. And one of the things that it's important to hear and hear again is because just because you've heard something doesn't mean it's true. But you were created to hear things. So often when you hear a truth from the word of God and it, it, is, it, it is not in line with some unbelief that you've heard or some truth that you've heard, it's difficult for you to receive it. So subconsciously, even a lot of believers align with unbelief and they think it's God. They've actually aligned with their cultural understanding than the word of God. Got quiet with that one, but it's true anyway. What was I saying? Oh, David and Goliath. It's fascinating. Read the story. They tell David, they go, this is what's going to happen to the man who defeats Goliath. He gets the king's daughter and less taxes. I don't know if you're catching this. They knew the same thing that David knew. Their response was fear. 
David response was getting a prophetic vision of seeing Goliath defeated. They both had the same information. David chose to honor the word of God and do something about the authority that God had given him through that word. And we'll take a step further. This is a young teenage boy. God's not a respecter of persons. And all these guys had been trained for battle. Let me put it in modern day vernacular, western vernacular. They'd all been to Rama. They'd all had all Roberts laid hands on them. They all had, in, you know, they were in the 30, 60, 100 fold line. They'd gotten a prophecy. You know, they, were, they, had, a, they had a title to their name. And that didn't, that, that, that didn't measure up when they didn't use the authority that God had given them. So God expects your measure of faith to grow. Tell one more story. I'm telling you, I haven't arrived in this subject, but this is true. And it'll work for you if you believe it. Don't let yourself die in propaganda. Don't let yourself live below the measure that God wants to take you into. You're too valuable to live a mundane existence. I'll say that again. Somebody need to hear that. You're too valuable to live a mundane existence. I had a dream, I think it's about seven years ago. I've told this before. I don't think I've ever told this here, but it's, it's, it's I believe, very important. I had a dream where, and most of my dreams are very literal. And in this dream, Jesus came to me in this dream. And there was other leaders there, but he specifically focused on me. And he came over to me. And he said to me, stood right in front of me, he said, Abner, don't you know you can have what you say? And in the dream, it brought me back. Because you, you actually can relate to God in the dream because the spirit world never sleeps. Read Solomon's account. It's a dream. That what transacted in that dream became real life to Solomon. The spirit world is a whole lot bigger than we make it out to be. So I said, I said, I began, this is funny, I explained, I wanted to explain to Jesus in the dream. I said, yes, Jesus. You know, that's how we started the ministry. We just had a word from God and you told me I was going to go to the nations and the nursing home wasn't inviting me, but we had a word from you. <laughs> Jesus did not seem very impressed with my explanation. So he told me again, he said, Abner, he was, he's a little more stern this time. Abner, don't you know you can have what you say? So he didn't understand the explanation the first time around. So I, because I'm a good servant, I was going to help Jesus out again. <laughs> I began to explain to him again. Finally, what does the Bible say? Something is established by two. He looked at me and he said, No! Don't you know? Spit on you, sorry. You can have what you say. Dream ended. I didn't call the intercessors. I did not get out my dream interpretation book. I knew exactly what he was saying. It's in the Bible. We don't have time to read it. Jesus said, you will have what you say. Why do I say that? My last point is today is faith is released through the words in your mouth. How do you partner with the Lord to create the world that he intends you to live in? You open your mouth and you begin to declare. And faith is persistent. Here's one of the number one lies of the enemy. He will use your current experience or lack of experience of what he's speaking to you about you and define you by that. Right before David defeats Goliath, his, old, his brother goes, you're just the guy who takes care of sheep. You're not a warrior. Basically what he's saying. Faith gives you eyes. You receive this word? Why don't you stand on your feet? Lift your hands. In the name of Jesus, I bless you today. 
to walk by faith and not by sight. I see a door opening for some of you. I say a door into the realm of the spirit that you've never walked in where your eyes will see by faith and not by sight from this moment forward. I bless you to hear and to hear again. I declare that the word of the Lord will run swiftly in your life as never before. I declare where the enemies tried to put you down, faith will arise in Jesus' name. I say to you, I bless you by the authority God has given me as a prophet of the Lord to, 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 to look to the word of God as your highest standard. You are not defined by your circumstance. You are defined by what thus saith the Lord. And he says, you're well able to go up and possess the land. You're well able to defeat your mountain. You're well able to overcome. And I say that this will be a season for this body to walk by faith and not by sight as never before. For the Lord says there are new horizons. There are new places that I'm causing you to walk. I'm going to cause you to walk on the waters never before. Some will say we've never been here. And some will even abandon ship. But I say to you that this is a season of overcoming. This is a season of breaking through to have a touch in this city that you've never had. Just lift your hands. There's a release of healing. In the name of Jesus, if you're sick in body, just receive healing by, by, the, word, by the word of knowledge. Be, I, I release healing to your shoulder, right shoulders being healed, back, uh, neck pain being healed, your, uh, your, the bottom of your feet are being healed, your knees are being healed. Be healed in Jesus' name. Receive healing in Jesus' name. Issues of blood, arthritis be healed. If you have anything in your, condi- in your body that was not called out, there's a release of healing. Just put your hand on an affected area if it's not embarrassing. I'm telling you, I'm not making this up. There's a healing power in this room right now. In Jesus' name, I command sickness and disease to leave your body. And I release your healing. Some of you feel the fire of God. Receive the fire of healing in your body. Somebody, that bottom of your feet are being completely be healed now. There's a fire on the bottom of your feet where the Lord is healing you now. God is lifting off, just, just lift your, because it, there's a rest in faith. God is lifting off burdens. God is lifting off weights off of some of you. Whew. Receive the breath of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, I say you're not leaving today the same. Because you're seeing, and you're seeing a high view of God. Listen, that's the word of the Lord to you. You are not leaving the same. Some of you have had difficulty sleeping. You're going to sleep like never before tonight. Mokaya. Somebody, I saw the second ago, the Lord is, the. There, there, you feel like a, a little hand right here on your hand. And it's, it's, it's actually the, the hand of the Lord. And it's delivering you of depression. Your mom was depressed. Your grandma was depressed. Be healed today in Jesus' name. Just lift your hands one more time. Just say this with me. I, I will walk by faith and not by sight. I will trust God. As my source of all things. Hmm. Just let that settle in. There's something about just letting that settle in because something just shifted in the room. 